A lot of preseason expectations aren't quite what the reality has been through three weeks of the 2024 NFL season. We'll explain here today on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. You are Locked On NFL Scouting with the Draft Dudes, your daily podcast for NFL and college football scouting. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's better than this? It's guys being dudes here on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. We're the Draft Dudes. I'm Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins. And we are your NFL experts here with you daily to talk team building across the league on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast with the Draft Dudes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to issue a big thank you, shout out, and welcome to our everydayers. Those of you who never miss a single episode, we appreciate y'all being here very, very much. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet, and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com to get started. Uh, Joe, any chance this is the week that Cam Taylor Britt decides not to speak on an opponent? You know, the funny thing about that was Zach Taylor's comments on it as if this hasn't been what Cincinnati has been doing for the last three years. It's like, oh, we, we praise our team. We praise our opponents. No, man, you hadn't done that. You guys have been first talking. It was, about- first it was Eli Apple. And then it was Jamar Chase talking about Mahomes every chance they could get. Right. And now it's Cam Taylor Ritt. This is definitely your thing. Yeah. Keep your mouth shut. And so what Worthy had, did Worthy score against Cincinnati? I don't think he did. I don't think no, he did. No. Um, that college offense. And, you know, you look at the passer chart, not the most robust or dynamic spray chart for a quarterback you're going to see, 91% completion, um, but a couple of big-time throws for Jaden Daniels. And for two consecutive games, they have not punted, which in the – uh, era of re- renewed defensive value in the NFL is what the 2024 season has shown in some ways. Uh, very impressive what Washington has been able to do with a rookie quarterback in Jane Daniels. Fair to say maybe, maybe a lot of season left, but maybe the preseason expectations were a little bit off mm. uh, for Washington. And that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, Kyle has labeled this, if you're on YouTube, as the dudes eat crow as we consider some of our preseason expectations based on the reality so far through three weeks. There's a lot of people. It's not just us, but we're the only ones on this program. So uh, the the stat courtesy of Ben Fox of uh, this is sports betting for agent, formerly of ESPN NFL underdogs of five and a half points or more are 14 and two against the spread and 10 outright wins, which means they are 10 and six. Straight up, five and a half point underdogs or more in the first three weeks, and those teams went five and zero oh in week three. So there is perception, and there is what is perceived to be the divide of teams and who has it and who doesn't. And then the actual application of that has been very different for a lot of teams across the league. And we're going to look at some of the teams that we had higher or lower uh, and and maybe why they are overperforming or underperforming what our expectations were for them as teams. Uh, when we looked at these teams individually under the microscope back in June, July, and early August. Yeah, that's why you got to play the games, right? That's why you got to play them. Every, All every, right. every season, every season's a unique season, right? There's no transitive property, none. What you did last year doesn't matter for this year. What you were good at, you don't assume that you're still good at that. You have to redo it every single year. And it'll, I mean, it'll continue to stabilize in some ways, but there are some discrepancies that we got to break down here. Yeah. So let's talk about teams that are overperforming versus what we felt about them as football teams. And uh, I think maybe you start with the two and one. Washington commanders and the offensive output that they've had 
early on. We had concerns about the offensive line talent in spite of the spending and trading away Jahan Dotson and, and what the skill group was going to look like. And uh, I, I think a lot of what it just boils down to for Washington is, is the moment is not too big for Jane Daniels. Huge. And um, he has made the big time plays. And I don't think either you or I questioned the physical talent of Jaden Daniels. It was more, how does he protect himself in the NFL? And part of the way that they're doing that with the offense in Washington is he's not being asked to hold the ball very long. And right now it's working. And I think that's really fascinating long-term because uh, there is the athletic component where if you have quick trigger passing offenses, that don't have an athletic quarterback, I think that changes how you can play defense against them a little bit more than the risks that come with trying to play defense against quick trigger passing offenses with an athlete like Jaden at quarterback. Yeah, it's the zone read stuff. It's a quick game and then sprinkling the, the in the deep stuff down the field. And it's it's humming. They're 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 playing good football here over the last couple of weeks. And certainly Jaden Daniels has been the best rookie quarterback. It's not particularly close. And so I I think if you're a Washington fan, you should be really excited, especially because I think there is room for this offensive line to be more talented. You know, what do they have in terms of wide receivers outside of Terry McLaurin? That's really a proven commodity. You know, you're going to learn so much about Jaden this year and and learn how to build around him. And uh, congrats. I mean, if it's been a while, man, since we thought that Washington was on a good path. And, you know, maybe this is one of those types of players in Jaden Daniels that combined with new ownership, combined with new coaching, really sets a new course for the organization and and everything's different moving forward. And so we didn't think much of Washington coming in. I'm concerned about their defense in some ways. You know, game scripts matter a lot and and how performances wind up happening. But Washington certainly, I mean, really a a much better team than, than I thought they would be early on. Yeah. And it's also worth mentioning, you know, it's it is three weeks. Washington was two and one at this point last year, too. Now, they were coming off getting waxed by the Bills by 34 points, but they won their first two games. Yeah. It, it does feel a little different, yeah. I, and, and I think the magnitude of going into Cincinnati against an 0-2 Bengals team that we'll talk about Cincinnati here in a little bit. Yeah. Um, but getting that win and the, the way in which you got it with it's not, oh, we stole it or they gave the game away, Washington and went in and, and took it. And I think that's why they're a team that, that should feel like it is a little different than what it was last year with a four point win over Arizona and a two point win against Denver. How about the Minnesota Vikings, Kyle? I feel like this three and O team, certainly not a team I expected to be in this spot and a couple of seemingly quality wins over the Niners, over the Texans. And obviously you know, you have the Niners and then you have the carbon copy of the Niners and the Houston Texans, but this team's playing extremely well and Sam Darnold's executing, they're running the ball extremely well. And then defensively, you know, they're forcing turnovers, two turnovers or two takeaways in every game so far this year, they're stopping the run. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a big part of their equation. And, you know, I think we'll, we'll continue to learn more about Minnesota. The season will play out, but I don't, think you can be anything but impressed with Kevin O'Connell and then even defensively what Brian Flores is dialing up with a ton of change with the pass rush group a ton of change with the secondary and it's coming together for them um I, th- I think we'll get a lot more clarity about the Vikings in the next three weeks or in the next four weeks because they're yeah. at Green Bay home against the Jets by week home against the Lions yeah. if they find a way to keep this level of Clean operation offensively, uh, continuing to change the picture on opposing teams and, and create mistakes and turnovers and force teams to be one dimensional defensively. Uh, it's going to get really interesting for Minnesota. Um, how for real is Sam Darnold? We'll see as the season goes on. He's probably playing the best ball of his pro career. I don't think that's yeah. a, a, a stretch to say. Uh, I think between Kevin O'Connell and Brian Flores, what well, Brian Flores didn't work out in, in Miami because he couldn't coach defense. And you saw the job he did last year that we were very complimentary of it. It was, hey, do they have enough there that they can can build out uh, more ways to attack you? And it, it looks like right now the answer is yes. And I, I think that has put them. This is one of the teams that from a coaching perspective. They are 
third in the league in scoring offense and second in the league in scoring defense. I mean, good they, spot it's, to be. It's they're, they're getting turnovers. They're running the ball. I mean, they couldn't run the ball to save their life last year. Yeah. They corrected the Alexander Madison issue. Anytime we can cast a little shade that direction here on this program, we like to do that. But uh, uh, they have found and pushed a lot of right buttons, and it's a marathon, but, man, they, they look great. They do. No, no Hawkinson. Addison's been out. You know, it's it feels like it's only going to get better, but they'll be tested, like you said. All right, folks, we got a whole lot more to get into, including some more overperforming teams, underperforming teams, so be sure to stick with us. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't even visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. So hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. I don't think we mentioned that Minnesota has 16 sacks in three games either. Healthy. Grenard, Van Ginkle, these guys. And and it's not because it's Patrick really scheme. Jones has four. It's really scheme though, right? Like they're just really confusing protection schemes, mm-hmm. and it's not like one on one on one wins, man. They're dialing it up, getting free runners. It's working. We'll find out though. Additional overperformers. New Orleans. Yeah, we got to mention them. Obviously, the a much more reserved uh, scoring output in week three against Philadelphia. And I think you you kind of saw what the question was there. But, I mean, we looked at New Orleans and we said they don't have depth. We're concerned about the offensive line play. And uh, we didn't really like the coaching staff and didn't know anything about the new offensive side of the ball. Well, we yeah. got our answers on the offensive side of the ball with Clint Kubiak. Looks great. <laughs> it's just a matter of um, – them maintaining their ability to run the ball. And if they do that, I think they are a team that is going to have a little bit of staying power as long as the depth doesn't get tested. Yeah, and they were they were close on some explosives uh, to Shahid against Philly. They weren't able to connect on a few of them. Maybe that game looks a little bit different. Um, so, yeah, that game certainly looms. But, I mean, they mopped the floor with the Panthers and the Cowboys. And defensively, there's a lot to like about what this team can be. And so... Man, we'll, another team we'll find out about at Atlanta, and I, I like some things about Atlanta, at Kansas City, Tampa, all coming up in their next three. So they'll, they'll be tested. Um, but, yeah, I think the Saints, there was some chatter that, hey, could this team possibly start the season 0-6, 1-5? Well, they're well, they're well ahead of the, of the pace there and, and certainly a, a team that uh, cannot be overlooked. And we have went from thinking maybe Dennis Allen's, Allen's the first coach fired to – yeah, maybe they got a chance to win the division. Anybody else on this side? Defense? Um, it's still, it's, the jury's still out on some teams. But I think in terms of the biggest overachievers based on our expectations, that certainly feels like the, the right three teams. Maybe a, maybe a quiet shout-out to Seattle? Quiet shout-out. Quiet. Uh, teams that are not performing to the standards that we have. And there's a few uh, teams that won 12 games last year, the Cleveland Browns, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals, 0-3. Oh, they get Joe Burrow back. They'll be fine. Well, the start of the season, well, they start slow. They'll be fine. Well, now they just lost to Washington and sitting at 0-3. 0-3 is not a good spot to be, man. Like, you're you're not going to the playoffs at 0-3. That's just that doesn't happen. I think it's like a two percent chance, and yeah, I don't know. They'll play all the games. We'll see what happens. But Cincinnati, just man, it feels like a team that is late to arrive, like they have in recent years. You know, like Chase not practicing, Higgins getting hurt. Now the right tackle situation, yeah, is rough. 
I mean, with both of their preferred options now hurt. Vibes vibes are bad, man. And even like the – did you watch a Jamar Chase interview uh, on Monday Night Countdown? He was asked if he'd, you know, if he'd like to retire a Bengal, and he's like, I wouldn't mind it. It's like, man, dude, like – you, you just you just worry about operationally how they how they operate and and what that means for fostering the right environment to be a consistent winner and maximizing their talent. Uh, I mean, defensively, this team feels like a mess. They're not stopping the run at all. And at 170, uh, 149, and 108. And 108 to Cliff Kingsbury. Right, man. 170 to New England, 149 to Kansas City. They don't even want to run the ball. Right. <laughs> it's rough, man. Uh, I think you could draw some some inspiration in the point output leaps that they've had offensively, and they're getting healthy. They get T. Higgins back and Chase after not participating on all of training camp, uh, going from 10 to 25 to 33, and they got Carolina this week. You'd like to think that's a win. Andy Dalton might have something to say about it. Oh, a revenge game if there ever was one. And then they're they're home against Baltimore. Good luck. So and then the next two are on the road. So they their their margin is very slim. Um they are 21st on third down defensively. They've given up five for five on fourth down conversions for the season uh defensively as well. So run defense, uh situationally. It's a bad mix for them right now. They don't have a run game to lean on either. So not that they ever have, not, but you got to play a little bit different these days. And uh, it's, it's, you know, I think Burrow's got the stuff to play quarterback the right way, but is he complimented well enough with the run game? Is he complimented well enough with what this defense can be situationally? Plenty to be concerned about. Uh, speaking of concerning, sp- specifically on the defensive side of the football, uh, the San Francisco 49ers, Javon Hargrave out for the year with a torn tricep. Uh, Christian McCaffrey in Germany seeing an Achilles specialist. And we we had this, what, graded as the best or second best team in the NFC coming into the season. Brandon Ayuk looks like he hasn't been a participant in mm. the entire month of August. Right. Uh, that That is a little bit of a theme when you consider... Cincinnati and Jamar Chase and Brandon Ayuk and a um, couple more teams that that maybe aren't performing to standards that we thought. The, the, the Browns with their quarterback camp practice. The Dolphins gave everybody a rest day every other day for the entire training camp window and, and preseason. Um, but for San Francisco, and defensively, their, their metrics are bad. They're hurt. A lot of their identifying players, as far as the, the pillars that help make the offense go, are banged up. Um, they got a couple game lull here, I, I guess, with New England and Arizona at home. Although I don't think Arizona's a tough out. And then they're at Seattle, Kansas City, and Dallas. And then they're out of the bye and they get Tampa Bay on the road. And Seattle at Green Bay at Buffalo. Sitting at two and one and two right now. Yeah, I mean, so many circumstantial things are tough. You mentioned the injuries. I mean, even Debo with a calf, Kittle's got the hamstring. Um, it's it's tough to not have your your players that you you want in place, especially when you know you think about a lot of the players on defense and and the lack of stability that they've had at that coordinator spot. Yeah, to really stabilize the system and and maximize what you have. Um. They are they are thirtieth in the league in net yards per attempt defensively, and they are twenty first in the league in uh, yards allowed per rush. And Hargraves out, man, yeah. and that's been the thing with the 49ers. Whenever they've been had, they can't stop the run. And and I mean, Hargraves out. I thought I thought they were already kind of thin in terms of his running mates. So tough scene, man. It, it feels like the momentum that they had coming into this year on paper is pretty spoiled at this point in time. So, yep, circumstances there are very, very tough. Opposing teams, I have a hard time believing this is right. Opposing teams, what yard line do you think 
through three games, the average drive for an opposing offense is starting at what yard line against San Francisco 49ers in three weeks. I mean, you would think something like the 30 or 35, something like that. The 35 yard line. That's yeah. 30th in the NFL. It's the third third worst average starting field position for opposing drives. And their efficiency per pass and per run <laughs> numbers yeah. are not good. Giving it up. I, I guess the well, let's save it. We got more, we got more to get to. Yep, more to get to, folks. Be sure to stick with us. Hey, NFL fans, you could start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So you get a hunch in the middle of a game. You can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Check it all out on FanDuel.com. All right. Where do you want to go now? You you were ready to go somewhere and then pulled yourself back off the ledge. Yeah, I, I think we should mention Cleveland. Um, really, the, the roster is, is good. Uh, very talented group. Obviously, the concern being what you're going to get out of the quarterback's position with Deshaun Watson, and that has not been good this year. Um, but, I mean... To, to be at one and two, you're gifted seven points against the Giants in Cleveland, and you can't you can't win that game. Uh, you you played a tight game with Jacksonville. You lost to Dallas, and I I have zero respect for that operation in Dallas. This team this team looks bad. Yeah, under under eighteen points in scored offensively in each of their first three games, and dealing with some offensive line injuries in addition to Nick Chubb. Um, now, Miles Garrett sounds like he's hobbled pretty bad. Looks like the scans after the game on, on week three uh, said there, there's nothing structurally that that is super alarming. But they're sitting at, at one and two, and they got to go on the road for the next three games. So They're, they're not going to play another game in Cleveland for about a month. Uh, the 20th, is, October 20th is their next home game. And you can't assume anything with Cleveland. Like this is Dallas, Jacksonville, and the Giants. That's not three good teams. Right. And now you have the Raiders at Commanders and at Eagles next. I hate it. I mean, you're gonna be you're in a big old hole here. I think the biggest thing for them is it's it's just so one dimensional with their adjust their net yards per attempt passing the football is three and a half yards. It's terrible. Like, and that's terrible honestly, running the ball, let alone right. passing the ball. It's terrible. So I think I think Cleveland, they're yeah, they're third in the NFL in pass attempts, too. They're third in the NFL pass attempts and 30th in passing yards. So it's like all your worst possible case scenario outcomes <laughs> for that individual position for Cleveland have been realized. Your running game's not what it can be because you got offensive tackle issues and you've got now Wyatt Teller's hurt and Nick Chubb's hurt and David and Joku's been dealing with a high ankle. Yep. Ankle sprain. Um, it, it, you just wonder, is the season going to get away from you before you get a chance to kind of get things stabilized? If you're at Mike and Kyle. That, and that's, that's very parallel to what's happening in Miami too. Uh, I think you, you. This is a team we have that we had. This is a top ten team coming into the year. They're one and two. They should be zero and three. And Mike McDaniel's just forgot how to call a game. It's it's incredible. Sitting here calling plays for for Skylar Thompson like it's it's Tua. If you want any affirmation of, of Tua versus the narrative of anybody can run this offense, it that looked like me out there playing quarterback. And guys are open, but he can't process it. And shame on Mike McDaniel. You've had this guy for three years. Yeah. You know what he is, or I, I would have thought you would have known what he is. You had 10 days to prep for the game. Yeah, and you saw four quarterbacks, four backup quarterbacks win, <clears throat> excuse me, last week. Right. And players that, the, the, what's the appeal with Thompson? It's year three the in, that, in the, the system. system. Well, system. it's not year anything from Malik Willis in Green Bay. It's not year two weeks. Two weeks. 
Sam Darnold in, in Minnesota, games. right? I mean, that's <laughs> Fields in, in Pittsburgh. Like this was a, a calculated choice for a quarterback in Tua that he was healthy last year, but he hasn't been healthy. And well, and and he got the contract done, and the first opportunity he had right. week two, yeah, to make some kind of decision about protecting himself, he put his head down and tried to run somebody over after already getting the first down, down three touchdowns. Yeah, in fourth quarter, right? Right. So uh, Miami gave out a bunch of these contracts, gave out a, a Jalen Ramsey, and I think Ramsey's been better each week, but he didn't practice for two and a half, three weeks. How much of that was really hamstring? Yeah. You know? Uh, but he, he saw the other guys all get their money. Correct. Right. right. And, and everybody else here bigger issue? Oh, who gets a contract. Oh, Tyree's got three years left on his deal and got it redone. Everybody holds the hand out. Right. And man, for a, a laid back coach and for their load management, it's like it kind of like what we talked about with Cleveland with the worst case yeah. worries that come with the storylines of their quarterback situation. Every worst case scenario for just about every button they could have pushed has arisen for the Dolphins. And the one thing that they've done well that Mike McDaniel refuses to do more of is run the ball between the tackles. They've done it three weeks in a row. And it's like, hey, that that helped you close and win the game against Jacksonville. Oh, Buffalo's down both starting linebackers. Maybe they'll get down and they're starting nickel. Maybe they'll get downhill and run at them. They showed they could do it. And there's opportunity. They chose not to. Right. And then lo and behold, what's the one good thing you do? You have four first half runs between the tackles on gap scheme against the Seahawks, and they all go for at least eight yards. One of them got Cole back for holding. But after the third one, you decided to call 12 straight passes. Mm -hmm. It's it's insane. And it's, you know, Mike, you're not playing Madden. I know you got Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle. Call the game like to he, your quarterback. Feels like he is. It feels like he is, though, right? Yep. And, and the fortunate thing for Miami is if things get ugly, and I think things can get very ugly there because they got a lot of vets that came in with the expectation to win. And I don't know that you could just sit here and expect who is going to show up after the four weeks on IR and be back. Like it doesn't – you don't yeah. get the warm and fuzzies that that's exactly what's going to – or it's guaranteed that it's going to play out that way. You, yeah. you could lose a lot of vets in that locker room in this building if this thing goes south. Everything everything sends it to a – concussion has been strange. Like even McDaniel coming out with, I thought very good messaging about, Hey, like he doesn't, we don't even be talking about anything big picture here. Like it, there's a lot of stress. We don't want to put him under stress. And you find out he's going to Disney on ice the next day. He's flying across the country. He's on the sideline. Like, I don't know. I, I don't feel like you're, I don't feel like you're doing the things necessary to take this seriously and heal. Um, right. Which, which makes you wonder for a team that automatically built an out after one year into the contract. Do they want to see him back on the field and, and risk getting the injury guarantees guaranteed if they choose to go a different direction? Tough it's choices. Very, very, very messy. Yeah. Very messy. And, you know, you got Tennessee, one of the worst offenses in football, coming into town. I have no confidence they'll beat Tennessee. I don't think they will. Because the one thing Miami's done to, well is run the ball between the tackles. And what's the one thing you, you look at Tennessee's personnel and you say, mm, I don't think you're going to be able to do that. Run on those defensive tackles, right? The uh, two teams I'd like to point out, just jury still out type thing for me, Baltimore and Atlanta. They both sit at one and two. Mm -hmm. I like the direction for Atlanta. Like I thought they got so much better against uh, Philly in Week Two, like just throughout the course of that game. And I thought they played the Chiefs extremely tough. I'm very optimistic about where they're at and what the schedule looks like. For Baltimore, Kyle, I don't know, man. Um, I I think highly of their talent. I think highly of Coach Harbaugh. But I don't really like their chances on Sunday against the Bills. And if they're at one and three, I mean, certainly they can get out of that. But I I get a little bit nervous about them being able to kind of capitalize on the momentum they had coming out of last year and, and what this offense is going to be. I, I feel like just – they're they're not playing sound on the back end defensively. And I guess this has been true about Baltimore at times before, especially early in the season. They generally figure it out, but yeah. Jury just jury's still out. I'm, I want to find out what what the Ravens are about this year. 
Yeah, I think I think you're seeing the defensive depth chart or, or the defensive coaching staff losses that they incurred. Massive. At, at, it doesn't show up all the time. Like they've got some really good metrics defensively. Like their run defense has been really good. Yeah. They're averaging 2.8 yards per carry allowed. <laughs> like, right. Really good. Uh, but but you mentioned the um the back end communications, and that that's how you drop that game to the Raiders. Um it kind of showed up down the stretch as Dallas made this thing much more interesting than it should have been. Right. And you, you mentioned their week four opponent in Buffalo who can go all different directions with, with where they throw the ball. You know, it's the, the pressure's off to feed a guy, and it's now just take what they're going to give you from a, a coverage perspective. And you feel like Josh is going to do that. So um, it's going to have to be, I think, for Baltimore, they're going to have to win with a lot of points against Buffalo. And whether or not that actually happens, it's uh, Lamar's track record against Buffalo's defense has not been good. And right now it doesn't seem like it matters who's in or out of the lineup for the Bills defensive death chart anyway, which is a testament to their coaching. Yeah. I mean, that'd be tough to, <clears throat> excuse me, to have, no, you wouldn't have tiebreakers over Kansas city or Buffalo. And then you get Cincinnati the next week. <laughs> Let's talk about a, a find out some things type situation. I kind of like them against Cincinnati because I think they will be able to, run the ball, I guess, but they're, you know, they're just still concerned about their offensive line to an extent, but I mean, 185 against Kansas city, 151 against the Raiders and 274 against Dallas. I mean, that, that should be a, a part of what they are, but if, if, if they somehow get in game scripts where they, they have to really play the game differently, you kind of get nervous about that. So jury's still out. That's the point with that one. What, what, what do you think this whole, um, I guess we're, we're maybe going to show our rear ends here a little bit. The whole run the ball too high discourse. Because I think this is a, a team in which like it's it's very ac- applicable, right? Where they're here for almost 300 yards against the Cowboys. Yeah. And some of that's you're concerned about the linebackers that they have in the defensive interior. But uh, j- just kind of the. I don't. You got Tom Brady catching strays on social media for talking about ability to establish the run and EPA of runs versus the value of passing the ball. And I don't know. It just does. Doesn't it, doesn't it just feel like if teams are going to allow you to have light boxes, you should run the ball. Of course you should. Um, Hoping to pull up a metric. Feels like that's made made to be a bad thing to say out loud. Is if you think that. You know, one thing that I'd say about Baltimore, though, that's different than I would say Kansas City and Buffalo, is I don't know that Lamar's had to deal with the same defensive structure that Mahomes and Allen have, and I don't know that they are necessarily having to evolve as much and how they play. Um, so for Baltimore specifically, it feels like they're already kind of built that way. And it was, it's, it kind of, you know what I'm saying? That, like, it doesn't feel like this, the rule, the same rules apply here. I think that's fair. But it's, it's, it is just an interesting kind of data point in this season, I think, with the focus on, running the ball and the value of being able to run the ball. And it feels like it's being applied to a lot of teams, but I don't know. I I think there's also something to be said about the downside of turning every game into a glorified seven on seven and and throwing the ball every opportunity you you can over expectation. And Oh, there, I don't know that I'm really trying to, to finish with as a thought here. I just was interested in your thoughts on it because it's, it's been something that keeps showing up on my timeline. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like if we're going to play base nickel and with two high safety shells all the time, like, yeah, I want that safety or that nickel running down from nine yards of depth and trying to tackle my running back in the hole like that. that I, I want to be able to do that. I think what's lost in the discourse is two things. Number one, I think the quarterbacks are bad uh, across the league and like you're comparing this, 
era of football against really sensational quarterbacks that have recently retired. I think the the NFL just hasn't put the quarterback talent into the NFL, and and you, you can talk about development and all that type of stuff, but the quarterbacks aren't as good. The other thing that I, I don't think people are comfortable talking about is how game script dependent things are. Like when you can play, if you can play defense with a lead, it's different, man. Like we yeah. talk about Dallas, like congratulations on having pass rushers and ball hawks. Doesn't matter if you can't stop the run. And I think game scripts are getting away from some teams that are taking away from how they want to play football uh, and how they're engineered to play football. I think you, if you're a game script dependent operation, that's that's just tough. You have to be able to win in multiple ways, and I don't know that there's enough teams that are built to be able to do that. Right. It's like having having a an identified or a preferred identity is good. I, I think it's necessary. But was it the Miami? What is it? Was it somebody on the Miami Hurricane staff that I was just listening to? And he said, when as a coordinator, you're going to go into a game, and you're going to have watched the tape. And you're going to have answers for what that team does. But when you start the game, the team is going to do something else first. Yeah. Right. And then you have to problem solve those things that they're doing that they didn't do before. And if you do it, usually before halftime, at halftime, that team is going to come out and do the things that they always do that is on tape that you then spent the entire week preparing for. And game script I guess maybe is the new talking point that we continue to pay more attention to throughout the course of this season, because I I think about a lot of games that have played out in the scripts in which they've been and and what that means for what teams are able to transcend and overcome that. And uh, that's, that's good food for thought as we wrap up this show, but that's going to do it for us here on lockdown. Phil Scott, I'm Kyle Krabs. He is Jeremy. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you list your favorite podcasts, make it a great rest of your day. We, are out of here.